It's for a guy that wants to live an overcoming life. It's for a guy that wants a model or needs a model of Jesus. Maybe this message is foreign to you. Maybe you just never heard of Jesus this way, the way we're talking about him as a strong man, as someone who's decisive, as someone who leads teams, um, as someone who takes control, as someone who's courageous and confronts inequalities of the day, who confronts corruption and tears down and makes a way for the people to come back to God throughout all the, the examples that we look at through the book. Welcome to The Serpent and the Knife. I'm your host, Frank Rich, and this is the only podcast in the world dedicated to helping men break free from the shackles of addiction through the power of faith and fitness. It is our goal with every episode to help you take back control and rebuild your body, mind, and spirit. And we do so by bringing you real and raw conversations with people just like you, aiming to find their place in this world while dealing with the everyday struggles and battles that we all face. Now, it is my belief that we were all created for a specific purpose. And if we can harness that belief or faith, then take control of our mind and body or fitness, then we can ultimately create the life that we've always dreamed about, our own superhuman life. I want to let you know how grateful and blessed I am to have you here with me today. Let's get on to today's show. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to a very, very special episode of The Superhuman Life. As always, I am your host. Frank Rich, and guys, I have a very, very special guest with me here today. For those of you guys that have been around since the beginning, since episode one back in July of 2019, may have heard a little bit about today's guest. Um, and for those of you that that, that weren't a part of, of that first episode, A, I do recommend you go back here after today and listen to that, because I think episode one really lays the foundation for everything that we're doing here. This, you know, it is a, it is, it is my story, my transformation. It, and it really uh, brings us up to speed on, on, on the mission of the show, on, on how we got here today. Uh, but my guest here uh, today has played a very instrumental part in this show, in, in my story, in my transformation, in my journey over the last few years. Uh, so I'm going to jump right in, into today's episode and, and, and pass it off to, to Josh here and let him tell you who he is and, and why we have him on episode 59 specifically. So Josh Kashadorian, my brother, welcome to The Superhuman Life. Frank, thank you so much. I have been waiting for this moment. I'm so excited to be on your show. I'm so excited about The super, Superhuman Life. And I'm so excited about everything you're doing, what you're called to do, and all the people that you will impact through your work and this podcast. So appreciate it, brother. Thanks for having me on. Well, no, I, I, I appreciate you. And, and, and you, you know that this has been something that has literally been waiting for 58 episodes. Right. So why don't we, why don't we start off with, you know, I, I mentioned there in, you know, in, in the intro, you know, that, that you played a very, you know, instrumental part in, in my story. And, and I mentioned you, you know, a dozen plus times uh, in, in, in the last episode with Steve, you know, we talked a lot about, that day there on on Church Street. So why don't we tell a little, you know, why don't we tell the audience here a little bit about about who is Josh? Why has Frank become his best friend in the world? Um, and let's kind of give a little backstory on, you know, our 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 our, our kind of relationship together. If that's yeah, the best man, way to start. let's do it. So I'll, I'll go from my perspective, okay, and then you can fill in the gaps because there's there's two people in this relationship, and we both approached it, and we we see things through our own lens. Um, but mm. uh, just for the audience, for everyone that's listening. Um, I'll tell you, I was part of an online and uh, online mastermind group where I met Frank at a live meetup. And Frank, you know, some people and listeners will get this. Some people you just connect with. You know, it's rare when you find someone you really connect with and you can build a friendship. And I'll just personally say friendships are built when when two people approach the relationship and there's curiosity, there's shared interests. Um, and there really is a listening and exchange of ideas that take place. We all know there's probably someone in your life right now, and they're probably not playing a big role in your life, and that's the person who's always speaking or always needs to be heard. But when there's an exchange of ideas and two guys can just share life and take an interest in each other, that's where a real friendship um, forges and emerges, and that's what I have with you, Frank. I mean, right from the very get-go, um, you know, we just hit it off. We, we have a lot of shared interests, a lot of things in common. I remember, you know, the dinner that we had together at that event. Um, great conversation, you know, in-depth conversation, stuff that's more than just superficial. And 
I mean, I hate superficial talk, right? I don't want to waste time with just talking about the weather or whatever it is. So when you meet a brother that you can really go deep with, um, it's very, very valuable. So to tell this story, I mean, we, we hit it off as friends. We developed a relationship with some shared interests based on business and based on some marketing practices, some internet marketing ideas and strategies that we were sharing with each other. Um, we were just sharpening each other, bouncing ideas off of each other through this mutual interest that we had for what, Frank, about a year probably um, until that? At least a year, year and a half at, at least, yeah. Yeah. And I, I think I've been outspoken about who I am, um, but I never really forced my belief, my personal beliefs, my you know religious perspectives on anyone. Um, but I think you knew I was a Christian, right, Frank, from some of our conversations or some some conversations that we shared. A hundred percent, absolutely, yeah. So for me personally, and you know maybe there's someone in the audience that feels this way as well. Um, I had this great relationship with my friend, my friend Frank. And it was starting to, to wear me. I knew that Frank had a huge destiny over his life. And just because the way our relationship was, the timing, a lot of phone calls, I never really took the opportunity, right? I'll take responsibility for this. There's a right time and a right place for everything. But I never forced the opportunity to, to share my faith in a way where I was pushing anything on Frank. And I was just pray, praying for Frank. I was prayerful about this relationship. And then the day came where I got news through my job that I had a work meeting that I was attending in Florida. It was specifically in Orlando. And I reached out to you and I said, Frank, hey, can we get together while we're there for a few days? And that's when I had purposed in my heart, I had prayed for Frank that I need to share the gospel with Frank. I need to bring him, I need to give him this message that he was not aware of at the time. And I didn't even know what your level of of knowledge was when it came to the Bible, who Jesus is, Christianity, and we just sat down for a meal. And guys, if you follow the Lord, if I'm talking to any Christians in the audience, they'll know this, that, that the Lord will urge you and lead you to speak. And during this meeting, we went into a, a really nice restaurant. Um, we were, we'll, we'll talk about the street it was on after. We went into this restaurant, we sat in the back, and we just caught up on life. You know, we haven't seen each other live for, it's probably been a few months at that point. And I felt led and I had the opportunity to say, hey, Frank, something's been on my heart that I want to share with you. And is it okay if I tell you about Jesus? And do you remember what I specifically said to you to open that up? I remember a question. And I don't know if this is where, where you're going. You asked me a question about a relationship in my life. Um, and for whatever reason, that has kind of been the piece that has stood out to me uh, for, for these last two, you know, two plus years now. So is that where, where, where you were going? Yeah, I mean, I, I asked you specifically, what do you know about Jesus? And I remember you said, not that much. You know, I've been to church just a few times in my life. Um, you, you didn't have the benefit of growing up with like Bible stories or a huge frame of reference for the Bible and the gospel. And I asked if it was okay just to take a few minutes and walk through that God has a plan for your life. And now I'm in your, I'm in your life for a reason. And that that very day was ordained, I believe, for me to be there at that booth in the back of that restaurant with you. And what I did is I just shared the gospel with you. I told you about God's plan for man, God's plan specifically, um, and why Jesus had to come and die for our sins. And it was just such an awesome moment because the Spirit of God descended over that table, and you were overcome tangibly. I was as well. And I just looked at you because the presence of God was there. There was something in the room. So for anyone listening to this that hasn't experienced it, when God shows up in a manifest way, you feel it in your body. And we felt something, and I looked at him, and I was probably about to tear up because I saw the moment. I saw that you were ready, and I looked up and I said, Frank, you're ready. And you just said, I'm ready. You were just ready to surrender your life. And so we left that restaurant. As we walked out, I said, I saw a park around the corner. Let's go to the park and we'll just say a prayer there. Was, there was the waiter was coming back and forth. I wanted a little privacy to lead you in this prayer, this monumental moment of your life. And we walk out of the restaurant and I look at the street sign. I'm like, hey, Frank, I go take a look at that. So what was it? Tell us, Frank. It was Church Street. 
Church Street. Downtown, or, downtown Orlando, Florida. Frank received the gospel on Church Street. It was amazing. And then we continued to walk around the corner. We found a park. And I said, hey, I'm just going to lead you in a simple prayer. And we just believed that prayer. We believed that at that moment, Jesus Christ saved Frank. He repented of his sins. He was forgiven of his sins. And he accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And since that day, he's made a commitment. And we invited the Lord to come into your life. And you looked different. I still have a picture. I'll share it with you. I know you have it too. Um, you look different. You just look lighter. And I said, how do you feel? And do you remember how you felt? Or can you articulate what was happening at that moment? God, it, 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 it's hard for me to remember that, that specific, you know, feeling of, of that day because there's been a, you know, there's been a handful of, of days post that day where I really felt uh, the, 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 the spirit working. But I definitely know there that I felt like there was a, a weight that had been lifted off of me. And I could see it, and you looked different. Your countenance was different. There was like a light in your eye. And, um, and you said, I feel different. I feel different. And we looked up, and there was a building in the background of this park, and it said the History Center. And I was like, wow, you got the gospel on Church Street. We pray together to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. We look up, and it was done in front of a building in a park, and the building is called the History Center. And I said that history was made today. Your life will never be the same. And Frank, it's been a wild ride since that day, watching everything unfold in your life. And I'm just excited, bro, about all the stuff that you have coming up, what you're working on, and this mission that the Lord has given you. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm so excited too. And you know, I, I, I do have that picture. I have a couple. We took two pictures of standing out. There's one of the two of us together, and then there's one of me, just this big smiling grin. I mean, I, I, I probably look at those pictures at least once a week. And, and yeah, um, there was a, there was a gift. You know, that you gave me a copy of the Passion Translation, and inside, in the first. First page of there, you know, there's that that saying that you said right there. History was made today, 1022 Church Street, 17 Church Street, Orlando, Florida, right outside the History Center. Um, Let so, me Josh, tell one, one more part of the story because it was wild. There, yeah. There's more to it. So, if we're going to go there, we might as well just go there. Here's the other part of the story. When I was going down there to meet Frank, Frank Rich, there was another gentleman that I was also going to meet with. His name was Frank, um, and he's actually an author, someone I followed for a while, um, still follow, read his books. And I want, I knew I was meeting with this author. So I wanted to give him, um, wanted to give him a Bible. I wanted to give him a copy of the Passion Translation. And so I got the book for him. I almost like wrote a little insignia for him. I almost wrote a little note for him and I just felt held back. I'm like, ah, I'll just do it when I get down there. I did actually have that moment where I almost did it. Like I was just restrained. I'm like, I'll write it later. And when I got down after we had our meeting, Frank, I'm like, we need to get you a Bible. And then it dawned on me. I'm like, I have a Bible. It's in my room at the hotel, and I bought it for a guy named Frank. But what I realized is I bought it for the wrong Frank, and now I had to give it to the right Frank, who is Frank Rich. And so not only did we pray together, I was able to give you your first Bible right there, and it was just amazing. The way the whole story came together, it's just an amazing story. I'll never forget it. Yeah, and... and the world will never forget it either because outside of it being shared here, it's been shared at least a dozen times. You know, I've told a uh, variation of, of that story. So I just thought that that it was important to kind of open up here today with that, you know, because of where we're, where we're going to go, um, you know, where this conversation is, 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 is going to take us. I think it's important to, 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 to lay that context. So um, is there anything else, you know, Josh, that, that maybe, We've covered our relationship, but you know, let's 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 close off. Josh, is there anything else that that we want to get across to to our listeners before we really dive into this book that you wrote and and really just jumping into you know today's conversation? Um, so, is there any 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 last bit on on who Josh is? Yeah, I'll give you a quick background for anyone listening and is interested. So, I I'm a husband to Rachel. I'm a father. I have three children. Um, that's an amazing part of my life. My first calling as a husband and a father. Um, I work in, in the corporate arena. I've been there for over the past 15 years with a Fortune 500 company. I've been blessed to hold six different positions and just move up in that arena. Um, before that, I own my own business. So I have uh, the entrepreneur side as well, and then the corporate background. 
and um, just a lot of stuff going on in life. And we're going to get into it now. But um, the latest chapter is this call that I felt to write this book that we'll be talking about today and, and the message that I really want to bring forward on this show. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, Josh. So, yeah, Josh is, Josh is the author of The Standard, Discovering Jesus as a Standard for Masculinity. And really what today's conversation is, is we're going we're gonna to jump into, you know, why Josh felt called to write this book, what it is, what it's about, who it's for and why all men need to discover Jesus as the standard of masculinity. But before we really jump into the book, I think it's important. I want to read a couple of pages, if you're okay with that, Josh, uh, from, from your book. So that page book three. Born, and, that looks like yeah, this is a little bit. <laughs> this is a book that when, when, when you guys are going to give you, we're going to, we're going to obviously at the end of today's conversation, we're going to show you where you can, where you can get this book. And hopefully we do a really good job of unpacking it and really firing you guys up. But yeah, this is not a book that you just buy and read once. It's something that is studied. Um, and yeah, I've only had it for Josh, what do you send this to me three months ago? And it's, yeah, it's, it's been through, it's been through the ringer. So I'm ready for a new copy whenever you're ready to send one down. No Josh. problem. Um, <laughs> but page, page three, this is, this is the introduction to the book. I'm going to read directly. I'm going to read just a couple pages. So you guys hang with me here. There's a crisis among men. There's a debate raging over masculinity. Influencers, movements, and corporations are fighting to define what it means for you to be a man. With definitions like toxic masculinity invading the conversation, there's a tug of war over defining what the standards are for men. If you feel like your identity as a man is constantly in the crosshairs, make no mistake, it is, and it's not your fault. Today's man is suffering from fatherlessness, lack of purpose, lack of identity, lack of vision. We have lost the definition of manhood. Men are searching for their sense of value and meaning. Today's man is chasing status because he has lost in his significance. He does not know his authority and does not respect himself. The result of this is leaving men in a lethargic state, complacent and bored, men, mendering, meandering through mediocrity and is carrying a devastating impact on our families and our society. In 2018, news reporter Tucker, Tucker Carlson did a four part special on Fox called Men in America, where he discussed the shocking statistics among men. I've outlined a few here from his report. The average American man will die five years before the average American woman. Men are more than two times likely, men are more than two times likely as women to become alcoholics and or die of a drug overdose. 77% of all suicides in America are men and the overall rate is increasing at a dramatic pace. 43% increase from 1997 to 2014. Over 90% of inmates are male. Men lag behind in graduation rates from high school and college. Boys have more discipline problems. One in five high school boys are diagnosed with hyperactivity. Many are medicated. Men are the larger consumers of pain medication. Fewer get married and stay married. One in five American children live only with their mothers. This is two times the rate since 1970. 70% of men are either overweight or obese. And almost all mass shooters are men. As the media attempts to shape our view of men, from how we are portrayed in sitcoms and movies to what the news anchors, talk show, and radio hosts are saying, the banner of political correctness is flaunted to silence the man's voice and attempt to force us into a box, resulting in, one, men becoming ashamed of who, of who we really are and how to express our God-given identity, and two, men feeling threatened to break out into true identity for fear of consequences. Today's modern man is at the crossroads of an identity crisis double-minded and undecided on how to navigate through these seemingly perilous waters, he is left standing there, staring at the limited options in front of him, feeling lethargic and lacking energy, going through the motions as husband, getting by at work with no passion and no sense of purpose, and checked out as father. The masculinity spectrum in our present-day culture hosts the entire range of masked men wear from the bravado of the seemingly alpha male flexing hard to demonstrate an image of the self-made man flashing his trophies of materialism all the way to the submissive and subservient beta male afraid to offend anyone and willing to appease all. What is the modern day Christian man to do? Who is he to be? Where are our role models and how did we get here? This book is intended for the, this book is intended for the modern Christian man. Before we reframe manhood and present our model for how God created us to rule in the earth and demonstrate his kingdom in today's fallen world, we must first examine how we arrived at this point. So, Josh, I think the best place to start is how did we arrive at this point? Wow. That is a big question. And um, 
let me take it from this angle for anyone that's listening. I know we have a lot of listeners. You have a diverse audience and people might have different backgrounds, belief systems, um, the way their, their worldview has been shaped through their experiences and, and the way they grew up. Um, so what I would like to share, Frank, is that um, we see, and you can see it from some of those stats, and what's interesting about that is the stats are changing so much, those stats are probably outdated already. But we see the foundation, the foundation for civilization as we know it, the foundation for a healthy world, for a healthy environment, for healthy families, it starts with a man. And from that man, it starts with a family and how you raise your family. And all these things impact, if you just think about it for a moment, the relationship you had with your father, the idea and image you have of a father, of other men that became role models. And one of the things that was in my mind as I was writing what you were reading from those few pages was right now, there's never been a time in history where we have so much information available to us. If I just go to any social media channel, and right now they're exploding, there's more than enough social media channels to get opinions and viewpoints from and to gain knowledge from. We have the World Wide Web. The internet is so evolved. Um, what's in our devices, in our hands, in our back pockets, we're not missing information. And so with that abundance of information, as awesome as that is, we also get an abundance of perspectives and opinions from other people that are trying to shape us and tell us who we're supposed to be. Isn't that the fundamental um, concept of marketing, right? To tell us what you're missing, to tell us why you're not quite enough unless you have this thing or you buy this, this or you subscribe to this or you listen to this voice. So in that void, in that gap, if we don't have a firm understanding of who we are as men, or just who men are in our society, even if I'm talking to females right now, if we don't understand the order and God's plan for us, then we're going to seek to fill that void with a lot of information. And there's more than enough out there. And there's more than enough voices that are, that are delivering messages that are not true, or they're mixed with half-truths, or where are boys, where are we setting our role models from? Who are we trying to follow? What standard are we trying to live up to in this game called life? You know, what is the idea for what we want to accomplish, what we want to do? You know, you and I both come from the business stream, the marketing side. So we know like status is huge for guys, right? Um, we, you know, our default language is honor, respect, status, the way people perceive us. That's the way we're hardwired for many guys. Um, so then if that's my measuring system, I'm going to start looking to validate myself by things I own, possessions I have, titles that I own, um, things that I find an identity from outside of a proper relationship with God. God. So, so what, what is God's plan for men? Not an individualized man, sure. but, but men in general. Right. Um, it's a it's a great question. It's a big question, and it's worth it's worthy of our discussion and our examination. Um, one of the things we can do is we can go right to the beginning of the Bible in Genesis one. In chapter one, we see where God said we, he he brings the world into being. Right, um, five days of creation. On the sixth day, he made man, and he said, "Let us make man in our image." And from day right from the first conceptualization of the world as God is creating it, we see that he brings man into the world. And he says, subdue it and multiply and replenish and take dominion. And we were to govern, we were to be kings, we were to be rulers, joint rulers with God and the way that we ruled the earth. Now, everyone knows what happened next in the story. At some point after that great commissioning and that great partnership that we had with a father, our heavenly father, we fell into sin. And because of man's free will and bad decisions, um, we chose to sin and rebel against God's plan for our life. And that brought sin into the world. That brought a curse into the world. And even though God has chosen to reveal himself through all those Old Testament times, and he's revealing his nature, he's revealing the names of himself, his character, his attributes. He has a people that he calls to himself, and he has men that he comes upon and gives them mission all of these men throughout the, the journey of the Old Testament, even though they were known as men of God, they will all fall short in one area. 
and they will not totally complete everything that man was required and was destined to do from that Genesis chapter one moment when God created us. So what happens from there, Frank, is because we abandoned that leadership role, because we chose sin, um, because we went down this other path, um, you will read about throughout the Old Testament, you'll read about many men that were men of God, and they did amazing things. People who are listening, they might know the story of Samson, who is you know, blessed with amazing strength, supernatural strength, given for a purpose. God always anointed these men, and it came with a purpose and a destiny to deliver the people and to bring them into the next phase of their appointment with God. And what happens is he falls short. Samson falls short. He makes mistakes. He gets involved. I feel like this is such a great story, especially for your viewers, because of your mission, Frank, and because of who you are, right? We love to lift weights. We like to you know, gain strength. Every man is designed to be strong. And that was Samson. And not only just strong in the natural, but a supernatural strength that would come upon him when the spirit of the Lord came upon him. He was blessed and endowed with a supernatural strength where he could do amazing things for God's people to bring them into the appointed time and the appointed destiny that God had for them. However, Samson had a weakness. And we know today many men have weaknesses. And Samson had a secret. Samson fell in love with the wrong woman. He disobeyed God and he started to give his secrets away that God said were sacred. And he shared those and it ultimately led to his demise. So as amazing as the things that Samson accomplished, we see that he falls short. And ultimately history will record, he did some great things, but he did not live up to that true standard and the fullness that God has destined for man. And that's just one example, Frank. That's just one. There's many more. Did you want to comment on that at all? Because I, I want to share another example as well. Yeah, let's share, let's share, let's share another one. Um, because I know I know that that there are multiple ones and, and I don't want to spend too much time on on the old testament here because I want to get to, you know, your book and 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 the real reason we're, we're here today. But yeah, I think it's great to share another example. Yeah, I'll share one more. And here's the theme that I'm weaving through this. So um, God was looking for a man from chapter one. From chapter one, God was looking for a man. He created us, destined us to fulfill a specific role in the earth. And then we forfeited that role. So we have Samson come and we see that God was looking for a man, but Samson doesn't live up to it and fulfill everything that God destined him to do. So next, I want to highlight David. You guys might know the story of David and Goliath. David was a shepherd boy. Um, it's so interesting. Just one thing I want to unpack here because we tend to size each other up. This is what guys do. And we look at, hey, who's the best looking guy? Who's the biggest guy in the room? Who's the guy with the most accomplishments? And when, this, when, the, when the prophet came um, to David's father's house, he said, I need to see your sons. One of your sons is going to be the next king. And they went and got all of David's sons, um, all of Jesse's sons, and they forgot to get David. So all of David's older brothers were the, the pick of the litter, so to speak. These guys were tall. These guys were muscular. They had a presence about them. And when you look at them, you're like, surely this is the next king. This is the guy. But God was looking for someone different because he's not attracted to what men are attracted to. So he's like, do you have any more sons after he went down the whole line? Is this everybody? That's what the prophet Samuel asked Jesse, David's father. He's like, well, I do have one more. And they went and got him. And he was a, it says that he was a ruddy shepherd boy. He was tending sheep. But God says he was a man after God's heart. And they went and get David. And it's an incredible story. They anoint David as king. And later in his life, he will fulfill that mandate. He will become the king through a mighty exploit where he takes the head of, the, of Goliath, the giant, who's blaspheming God. And he cuts his head off. And from there, the story gets wild. He's escalated as king. And David does many great things in his assignment because God handpicked him, chose him because God was looking for a man. And what happens is David, as strong as he is, as mighty as he is, as called and chosen as he is, David still falls. This guy is on, he's in his palace one day. He's looking out at the rooftop. He sees another man's wife bathing 
and this is the Old Testament form of porn, Frank. He's watching someone else's wife take a bath on the rooftop. And he didn't just turn away, he entertained it. And he started looking, and you can imagine where his thoughts started to go to the point where he acted upon them, right? So David actually went as far as to take that woman, Bathsheba, and have relationship with her. And then on top of that, take her husband and send him to the front of the line in battle where he was killed. So talk about a man who failed, right? Huge failure in his life, moral failure, compromise. We see this all the time, even in our modern day, men fail. We hear about the compromise and they, they go down. But still, despite this, God redeems, he forgives, he restores, he has a plan for David, but we'll see that David has that scar there still. He has something where he never truly fulfilled everything God called him to be. So God's continuing through the Old Testament, always looking for a man, looking for a man to bring in and level up to the standard that he's called us to be. And throughout the Old Testament, we see these men, um, they're raised up of God, they do amazing and mighty works, but they fall short in one area or another, and there's a need for something else. That is great. No, I think I think for me, one of the, you know, one of the biggest takeaways here from from this intro here and and, and and with you kind of, you know, unpacking here, you know, from from the beginning, with me, the work that I do, like I I see everything through a very narrow filter. Like when I see men that are struggling with some of these issues, lack of purpose, lack of identity, lack of vision, my mind immediately goes to, okay, this guy has a problem with pornography because that's that's where my focus and attention goes. And and I'm doing amazing work and helping a lot of men in that narrow uh, narrow tunnel. But but really, I, I think panning out, standing, you know, really pulling all the way back like we did here, seeing it from such a high high level view, like. Men have been struggling with these these problems since since the beginning, and I think ultimately that's what we're here to try to solve. Um, so, so Josh, you talked about you know everything that you have going on: father, husband, entrepreneur. You know, you and Rachel, I know, are, are running a few different businesses over there, and then you have your corporate gig. You know, which which in and of itself, you know, most men can't even you know manage a career. At the level that that you have, so with all of that going on, uh, as we kind of slightly pivot in and really move into to the book in in the standard fifty nine, like why why did you feel this was a time for you to write this book, and what is you know the the mission of of the standard or or really standard fifty nine? Because I know that's 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 really the brand that the book is falling under. So why, with everything going on that, that you have right now, did you take on this massive undertaking? Of, of of writing this book and and and, and starting this this mission. Um, awesome question, Frank. So here's uh, for everyone listening. Here's one of the the number one lies um, that comes against you is that you are what you do. Just because you do a job or that's your title at work, that becomes your identity, right? You are what you do. Here's another lie. You are what people say about you. I'll give you a third one too. You are what you think about yourself. You might have incorrect thoughts of who mm -hmm. you are. So those are three major lies all men are going to have to overcome at one point in another. And just because you have a title in your day job, I work at a call center, I fix cars, I'm a personal trainer, I'm a salesperson, that does not define you and that is not your destiny or your ultimate call in life. I believe those things we do, they play certain aspects and seasons. There's certainly things that I've learned and that I had to learn from doing the various roles that I've progressed through in life, whether that's a job or just a station in life um, for a certain time around certain friends. But ultimately, um, we all have a call on our life to do that thing that God has commissioned us to do. So to answer your question plainly, I didn't sit down one day and say, I think I want to start something. I think I want to write a book. I think I want to you know, bring this message out. What happened is the message was there already within me from my upbringing, from different experiences I've been in, um, from different men I've been around, from, um, from groups, from people, from just all of our collective experiences that shape us and form us to who we are. And it was probably around 2016, Frank, that I, I sat down and I was just um, journaling. And I was just, you know, spending some devotional time with God. 
And I was just writing and I was starting to see different things in the life of Jesus as I was reading the Bible that honestly, I wouldn't be able to see at age 20. Um, in my 20s, these things, I probably wouldn't catch them the same way because of those exact things I spoke about, my life experiences, you know, working in the corporate environment, having to build high performing teams, having to hire people, having to manage people, um, all those responsibilities that we carry. Um, I couldn't have written this book in my 30s. I'm, I'm 45 at the time we're filming this right now and we're um, recording. And in my 30s, I wouldn't have seen it the exact same way either. So it was through the lens of my experiences and the journeys that the Lord allowed me to have where I could see Jesus in a different way. I started to pick up on something um, that wasn't necessarily explicit in the pages. Um, we know the words of Jesus and the messages of Jesus, and we love those. Um, but I was seeing something different as I was reading the Bible this time, and I was seeing what he was doing. And I was taking note of his methods. I was looking at what Jesus was modeling. And I was just seeing all these aspects come to life um, in the life of Jesus that it's not necessarily the things he was saying or teaching, although it can be. I was seeing things behind the scene or a layer deep, a layer deeper where I was seeing what he was doing and how he was conducting himself. And I just started to write about those things. I started to journal those and make a little devotional for myself. And somewhere along the way, I said, you know, I think I need to share this and get this out. So that's been a journey of, um, three or four years writing it at times, you know, we have busy lives. Like you said, my life is certainly really busy. Um, try writing a book when you have three kids, you work a full-time job, you have side projects. I had to get up super early in the morning. I had to find time um, where I could devote some time and some discipline to get this done and also be led, you know, with that inspiration that the Lord gives us to write this. So it's been quite the journey. Yeah, that's great. We're going to, we're going to get into that, er that early morning stuff here. Um, you know, I don't want to feel like this is attack, you know, attacking Christianity or attacking any single church or church in, 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 in general. But, you know, you talked about, you know, beginning to see Jesus kind of through a, through a different lens where, you know, where is, 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 is the representation or, or, or the teachings of Jesus, like in traditional, um, you know, schooling, Christianity churches, like where is it falling short to, to where we needed a book like this? Yeah, so I'll, I'll be really plain about this. So um, my frustration was um, I went to, uh, went to a men's group. I was listening to guys that were Christians. These are guys that are identify as Christians. Um, they even went as far as to go to church and hang out with other guys. And the theme I kept seeing, and I've seen this throughout my life, and I've seen it recently, where there's this overwhelming theme of guys saying, you know, just showing up kind of defeated in life, you know, just defeated, deflated you know, say, I just, I don't know what else to do. Life is hard. Work is hard. Marriage is hard. Yes, we have burdens to bear and there's things we have to do in life, but we are called as sons of God. We're called as Christians to live an overcoming life, a life that overcomes, not a life that's defeated. And I was seeing this defeatist mentality in a lot of guys. And it was really bothering me because I just saw things out of alignment. They don't know who they are and they don't know who they're following. And they were like, well, hey, man, I'll try harder. You know, let's let's try harder. Um, you know, I'm not we're not Jesus, but we'll just we'll we'll give it we'll give it our best. And that's not the Christian life. That's not the overcoming life. That's not the standard Jesus sets. And that's not the life he calls us to live. So that started agitating me a little bit where I said, OK, I really have to write this to get this out there for for men that grew up in church. And, you know, I, I love the church. It's, it's the Lord's body. I honor that. Um, but what happened throughout history is that Christianity has been feminized. And because of that, um, men don't want to go to church. Why? Because of the colors of the church, because of the flower arrangements, because of the songs we sing, for a lot of reasons. So anyone who's even listening to this, maybe this sounds strange to you. We're talking about Jesus as a man. I thought Jesus was like always with the children, holding a little sheep, right? Like he's, he's, he's always got a picture of a lamb in his hands and he's this humble and he's this soft guy and he's so gentle. Um, and that's not really the level of masculinity or the picture of manhood that most guys want to identify with. So although that's certainly one side of Jesus and yes, he has empathy, he has a very high EQ 
And he is a leader that leads with his heart and he, he demonstrates servant leadership and he's someone we can trust. That's not the only aspect of Jesus there is. So I went on this journey to start examining and what the Lord showed me was these six different dimensions in the life of Jesus that I really wanted to showcase. And I break those down in the book and um, we talk about them. By no means is this exhaustive. By no means is this an exhaustive commentary. You know, the Bible even says if the Bible, if all the books in the world were to record everything that Jesus did, there would not be enough books. So we could talk about Jesus forever and everything he's done and everything he is. So I've taken six dimensions that I've seen that have personally been highlighted to me. And I, I highlight for those, I highlight those for men in the book to show us what we're called to be and what the standard is in those six areas. Got it. So, so, so what type of men or who is this, this book for? Cause you know, you mentioned there that, you know, a lot of guys that grow up in the church, they get turned away, flowers, lights, colors, girl, feminized. Uh, but for me, that wasn't my upbringing. You know, right. I'm, I'm two years old uh, in, 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 in my Christian life. I, I, you know, I get this a lot of times like, Oh, Frank, you're very mature, you know, for your time spent. And I think that's because of the men that I'm around guys like yourself and, and Mike and Joel and Dan and all these other men that I make sure to get time with on a weekly basis. But also, um, and this was really one of the biggest takeaways for me was that Jesus as a high performer, Jesus as a man of, you know, you use EQ, emotional intelligence, you know, that's not a word that, that you hear thrown around in, you know, in church. Like, I, I, I mean, I, I walk in, you know, to, to my men's group on a Tuesday night and I, you know, I start talking about emotional intelligence. I mean, half the table is going to like look at me with a, with a crooked face. Um, so for me, it was amazing to, 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 to see the life of Jesus exemplifying all of these high performance principles and, and self-development practices that I've spent my entire life studying. So I think you did an incredible job with, with really bringing those two worlds together. But to bring all that back together, because uh, I think where I started there was, was who is, you know, who is this book for? Is it only for the guy that's, that grew up in and has that more feminized uh, view of, of Christianity? No. So thanks for asking the question, Frank. I believe this book is for any man that wants to know Jesus in a deeper way. Um, it's written for anyone that is has an interest in learning about Jesus from a different aspect. So one of the things we see in the Gospels, we know that Jesus identified as the Son of God. He is the Son of God. He's equal with God. But what's interesting is we peel back the layers and we look at what he actually said. Um, one of the things he would normally say is he would refer to himself as the Son of Man. Over 80 times, there's references to Jesus saying the Son of Man, referring to himself. So he is the Son of God, and he is the Son of Man. And when he says Son of Man, he's identifying with his humanity. He's identifying with his humanity. So back to those guys at the, the small group table I was telling you about, where they're like, we'll just try harder. We're not Jesus. Well, Jesus is saying to us by saying, I'm the Son of Man, I am in human form right now, just like you. He was tempted in every single way. The only difference between Jesus and us is that he lived a sinless life. He was 100% without sin, and we are not that way. However, he models this overcoming life and what that looks like. And so we look at that in six dimensions through the book. So who's the book for? It's for a guy that wants to live an overcoming life. It's for a guy that wants a model or needs a model of Jesus. Maybe this message is foreign to you. Maybe you just never heard of Jesus this way, the way we're talking about him as a strong man, as someone who's decisive, as someone who leads teams, um, as someone who takes control, as someone who's courageous and confronts inequalities of the day, who confronts corruption and tears down and makes a way for the people to come back to God throughout all the, the examples that we look at through the book. If this is new to you, then you're going to want to learn about Jesus Christ as the standard for masculinity and who he is and who he models, um, how he models for men. So what are these, these six dimensions that he modeled for us? And can you run us through, you know, just a quick summary of, of the six of them? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that was highlighted to me is really looking at the Lord's life and right now, it's a, hot, it's a hot term right now, especially in the self-development world. We talk a lot about self-mastery. And I look at Jesus and his model of self-mastery. You know, right now, if you look in the world of self-development, everything is focused around high-performance habits, um, around pro productivity, 
right? Around how can I do more? How can I maximize my time? How can I live my best life? Well, Jesus models that for us. But one of the things that I want to say from the get-go is that this, the message that I bring forward in this book, you'll see it overlaps with personal development, but it is not a personal development message. Okay, it's a message about Jesus as the standard that he sets for men. If you look at the personal development industry, one of the things that they do is the self is in the center of that. So I'm in the center, Josh is in the center, Frank's in the center in terms of how we make our decisions and what governs our life. And it's all about developing ourself, where the main difference with Jesus is that he lives a life in submission and surrender to the will of his father. And then we see him emerge in a model of self-mastery, but it's when things are in their right order. He's not just pursuing any dream or any goal. He has laid down his will and he has gotten a mission that he needs to accomplish. So it really starts with what are you trying to accomplish? And then we see that the Lord, the spirit of the Lord gives him the power to live that out and walk that out. And so in self-mastery, we look at his model for self-discipline. We look at how he demonstrates restraint. You know, Jesus fasted for 40 days before biohacking was a thing, right? So he fasted for 40 days. And we see principles of what he did when he goes on that fast, where he goes, how he separates himself from distractions. And we look at these things from a natural perspective, but it's fueled by a supernatural mission. And we look at how that can correlate with our life in that, in that book of self-mastery. So we see Jesus has discipline. Jesus is diligent. Um, Jesus was a hard worker. We know he was a builder. Some would say a carpenter. I would prefer to say he was a builder. He probably worked with wood, probably worked with stone as well. But for, for two-thirds, over two-thirds of his life, most likely the first 30 years from the time he was a young man until the time he enters his mission, You can find him um, building. You can find him working with his earthly father, Joseph, in the shop. You can find him um, handling customer service. And, you know, one thing I want to say on this is so many of us, we're waiting for our day to come, right? We're waiting for that big break in that moment when sometimes we just have to learn to stay in our position a little longer. Um, Jesus stayed there till the age of 30 is what we know. So there no doubt would have been days They were probably mundane, you know, doing the same thing day in and day out, diligence over and over, waking up, taking care of customers, building, doing repetitive motions, but still staying surrendered and humble and waiting for that right time when he was appointed to step into his mission. So that's what self-mastery is. That's a little taste of that in terms of what we look at. Those are just some of the elements. We talk about Jesus has a plan, uh, but you'll see there's a lot of things we break down in that first book. Got it. So that's the first of six. Yeah, let's just um, just continue on. I'm sorry. No, that's great, Frank. Feel free to interrupt or interject with any uh, any questions you may have. And what I did is I used symbols um, and I used um, actually partnered with an artist who did some amazing artwork in this book. So the symbol for self-mastery, we know Jesus was a builder, is we look at the measuring rod or a measuring reed, which would have been an ancient measuring instrument um, that builders would use. And not only did Jesus measure things physically and in his natural life and in work, but he's still measuring today. And that's where this image of the standard comes from, is how do we measure up compared to Jesus? He's still carrying that measuring reed, and he's he's measuring us according to what he's called us and destined us to be. So the next portion of the, the book, the standard, in book number two, we look at leadership, the shepherd's staff. And one of the things that Jesus confronts in his day and time is this image of leadership would be the kings. It would be the rulers of the earth who had multiple servants and castles um, and formidable cities that they would govern over. And Jesus comes in and does something extraordinary. Um, It's become popular now, but he was the first one to bring it in. And it's this concept called servant leadership. And what servant leadership is, and where he, how he demonstrates it is throughout his entire life. But one of the most notable scenes is when he tells his disciples to be the greatest, you must be the greatest servant of all. And we see him, we see the Lord of all at this scene um, at the Last Supper where he gets on his knees 
and he cleans the disciples' feet. He cleans his followers' feet. So we talk about leadership and how that is leading a tribe of men, leading other people by serving them. And this is a new concept at the time that he's bringing that into the earth. After leadership, we go on to communication. And I use the, I use the image of a chisel because his words and the way he communicates are like a chisel. Um, when he speaks to you, it will chisel things within you. And we look at him as a communicator, and he's an amazing communicator. Back then, Frank, there was no social media, not, not even any microphones, no AV equipment, um, no newspapers, no television. Yet, the message of Jesus changes the entire globe. It goes out in this small corner of the earth. And it literally rips our calendar system in two because of the way he communicates and what he demonstrates and the way he speaks and draws people to himself. And one of those ways, and we know that marketing has taken this, it's through effective storytelling. The way he tells stories, the way he invokes curiosity, and he stirs the crowd for certain people that he's drawing to really pay attention and want to know more. So we talked even at the beginning of this, like what good friendships are built on. Um, part of that is curiosity, you know, to be curious, to be interested in someone. And Jesus cultivates that curiosity within the listeners of the day and the ones that can hear it. This is why he always said, if you have ears to hear, um, those were the ones that were drawn and attracted to his message. So he sometimes wraps some of the things he says in riddles and he wraps them up. So only those that have genuine interest and full attentiveness would be the ones worthy to really uncover and discover everything he was saying. After book three, we go into book four, which is, book four is EQ. This is the fishing net. Um, and this speaks about the way Jesus, I use the image of a fishing net because obviously many of his followers in the first century were fishermen. They worked in the industry. Um, he didn't choose scribes. He didn't choose the religiously educated. He chose ordinary men. These would be blue collar workers. You know, and I just think it's so awesome that Jesus comes to earth and he models hard work and he chooses to work a blue collar job for the majority of his life. And these are the guys he's most comfortable with. Um, a couple guys with a, a few more sophisticated backgrounds, but the majority of them fishermen. And I use this image of the fishing net because he pulls people towards him the way those fishermen would draw in a net. And Jesus even says of himself, if I'm lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And it's that image of he pulls. He never pushes. He doesn't push us. He's not a pushy savior, a pushy Lord, but he speaks in a way where we want to respond. And he speaks in a way that demands a response. And that's that EQ component. We really unpack that part in the book. Um, we talk about, about the way he communicates. We give specific examples from his life to break that down, coupled with his leadership, um, specific strategies, tactics, things he did. And we break those down and we examine them and what they mean to us as men and how we should be modeling ourselves after the example of Jesus. The next portion after that is book number five, and this is confrontation. Now, this is the image of the sword. Um, and this is the part where I love to break that myth and break that old style of thinking that Jesus is just this soft hippie. He's just, you know, wearing his Birkenstocks and walking across, um, you know, Galilee somewhere in, in the desert. And he's just got this message of peace. You know, Jesus carried a sword with him. And I'm talking about spiritually. Um, what came out of his mouth was a sword. He said, my words, you know, they divided, they divided families. They brought division. You know, it was, it was what, to take another marketing term that we all know as marketers, it was prolific. He wasn't just bringing this message of unity. He was bringing a message of no compromise. It was so polarizing. This is what ultimately led to people wanting to take him and nail him to a cross because he was that strong with what he was bringing into the earth and the message he was speaking. And you'll see there's multiple people that he confronts and he's a man of courage and he always brings the truth. And there's one specific example, example I'm thinking of right now. You know, right now we have a lot of, um, we have a lot of stuff going on in the political arena. People are very opinionated and strong views when it comes to politics. You know, one of the things they'll tell you 
and the workforce is, you know, don't talk about religion, don't talk about politics. Well, those were the two things, those were the two realms that Jesus confronted the most. You know, he came and he confronted the religious order, and he also confronted the political spirit behind that. And we see that example when he goes into the temple and he rips down the displays. They had made the temple into this marketplace. They're now made it into a bazaar. They're selling goods. They have people coming and exchanging and turned it into a marketplace. And he comes in, he makes a whip. He personally braids a whip before he goes there. And he goes into the marketplace and he uses that whip and he overturns the table. This is physical strength. This is physical strength. He flips the tables. He corrects all of this injustice because this bazaar that was set up was blocking people from coming closer to the temple unless they bought things here. So what he was doing was confronting to make a way for the downtrodden. He was confronting to show us true leadership for standing up for the weak. These are the things that we are called to do as men today. And Jesus modeled it for us and sets the standard for us. And then what we do after every one of these chapters, Frank, we'll, we'll have a coaching section um, after every single chapter. We'll talk about what that means for us as men and how we can model that. And that's where we do our best to get real and give down to earth strategic and tactical tips and tools for how can you walk this out in your life as a man? Yeah, so we covered, we covered the five, self-mastery, leadership, communication, empathy, confrontation. And then the sixth and final one is, is love. Um, so yeah, and, and, and I'm glad you mentioned that, that coaching piece because I, I want to kind of talk about how guys should be consuming this book. You know, I think you and I, were kind of a, you know, we're, we're, we're a rare breed when it, you know, when it comes to not just men, but people in, in general. I think, you know, maybe 5% of the population actually purchases books to this day. But, you know, a lot of men are going to hear, oh my God, this book, and now there's six books. Like, I don't want to read another book and I, let alone six of them. Um, guys, it's not what it's, it's, it's not what it's, it's, it's sounding like. So Josh, can you kind of walk us through, you know, how, um, you know, how we should be consuming this? I know it was written in a very uh, strategic way for, for a reason, very short pages. So yeah, when we talk about those six books, it's not six different books. It's really six sections. Um, but Josh, I want to pause real quick. because I do want you to, to answer that question, but I want to, I want to just zero in on that confrontation part there because um guys when you do get to this part this is one that really just like for me i know it really opened my eyes up to to a side of jesus that that i didn't know and once again i'm i'm, I'm talking from a very uh immature christian's perspective here two two years but i think that this is going to challenge a lot of men whether it's been five years ten years their entire life just read you know read you some of some of the, the sections of of this book on confrontation Jesus is a man of truth. Jesus is a man of courage. Jesus is a man of endurance. Uh, Jesus is a man of confrontation. Jesus provides correction. Jesus is discerning of man, and Jesus is not safe. Um, yeah, so I just that 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 part there, that confrontation, really really opens my eyes up to to a side that that you don't hear a lot about of, of Jesus. But so getting back to Josh, how we should be consuming this? It's not six three hundred page books. It's not something you have to spend you know, 18 hours, you know, consuming this. So, so, so what can guys expecting if, if they're thinking about getting this book and, and how should we be consuming it? Awesome question. Thanks, Frank. So, um, yeah, so listen, I wrote the book specifically with guys in mind, right? I wrote it for myself. I wrote it for, for any guy that, um, that wants to learn more about Jesus and this aspect. And so what I did, number one, is um, it's written in a very, even though there's six sections, it's very logical, it's very sequential. So you can read it from front to beginning if you want to. If there's a certain attribute you really want to dive into, you can just dive right into that. If there's a certain section of the book where, you know, um, someone just gets promoted into a leadership position, like I want to learn about leadership. I want to learn about how Jesus led teams. I want to see what he did. You could read the leadership section, right? You could go to any section you want. You could go to any place as you need to, as you're led to. However, it would be my, it would be my, my my goal that most guys would read it front to back, but it's short chapters, two to three pages each, which I personally like. It just gives me a sense of accomplishment when I finish that chapter. Um, so very digestible. From the guys that have read it so far, um, some really um, guys, some guys that I respect from all different walks of life have given us phenomenal feedback on it. And what we found is a best practice is that guys like starting their day with it, that they would use it as a devotional style book two to three pages in the morning, and then they would just pick it again, pick it up again the next day. 
The other thing that's important to know about this book is I wanted to make something that you would be proud to have on your shelf. Um, that's why I specifically teamed up with Justin Stewart, who's a talented, um, phenomenal illustrator who drew the symbol. So like when we talk about the cross, you'll see a picture of Jesus's hand. And we really highlight his hand as a man throughout um, throughout the entire book. So when we talk about self-mastery, the measuring read, you're gonna see Jesus's hand holding that ancient tool. When we talk about the fishing net, you're gonna see his hands pulling the fishing net. You're gonna see his hand holding the sword and ultimately with the cross um, and the nail through his hand um, when we talk about his love for us. Um, so I wanted to make something that could be a keepsake. I wanted it to be you to be proud of it when it's on your shelf. Actually, I wanted to give this book to you, Frank. So you would say, if a guy came up to you and said, hey, can I borrow it and can I have it? I would love you to say, not this copy. This one's mine, but I'll get one for you. So certainly buy one for your buddy, give it to him. I'll give you one to give him, but I want you to have it, keep it on your shelf and be like, yeah, this thing is just, this looks good. I like it. I want it here and it's something that I can go back and I can read over and over or when I need to learn about that one aspect or be reminded of something, I can use it like a devotion. Yeah, and, and I think I'm a little selfish when it comes to my books to begin with. I don't, I don't let anybody borrow any of them. Um, I've lost too many over, over the years, but, but they're, to me, a book is, is, is it's, it's an investment. It's not just something you read once, but you, like I shared with you, I, I, I study, I, I, I study them. So yeah, this is, this is amazing. And guys, I, I got to firsthand, you know, not be involved in the process of, of this book coming to life, but, you know, we talked about, you know, at the beginning, Josh and I's relationship, you know, these last four years. So I know the passion that he put into this. I know the love that he put into this. Um, the artwork, like you said, is, is phenomenal. He left nothing short. I mean, the quality of the paper from the imagery to, to the, to the covering of itself is that glossy, glossy image. So yeah, this is definitely a book guys that Josh said, it, it, you're, you're, you're proud to have it on your shelf. Um, morning you talked about uh, a, a lot of guys here in the morning i know this is something that we we addressed in uh or you addressed in in the book you addressed it in a talk that you gave last last summer um can we talk about the importance of of all men having a morning routine and what should we be getting out of that morning because it's not just i don't think it's about doing the routine just for the sake of doing a routine but what are we actually looking to extract out of the morning right um, <clears throat> so what we see, first of all, in the life of Jesus, we see that Jesus was an early riser. There's no question about that. Um, we have multiple references throughout the book where we talk about Jesus had a morning routine. And what we know of his morning routine is that he spent a considerable amount of time in prayer. We do know that. And that he would be up early before daybreak, that there were certain times they would go look for him and they couldn't find him. And he usually found a place of seclusion or isolation where he could spend time with his father. We also know about Jesus, and I'm gonna tie this into your question, Frank, but we also know that Jesus said, I do what I see my father doing. So when he went out for the day's work, when he went out for his ministry for the day, whether that was speaking, healing, you know, producing miracles, that he was doing what he saw his father do. So he was living this life as a son where it was alive. It wasn't just, I have a plan. I'm going to work this plan. It was, he got up in the morning and he had a relationship. So what he models is he models relationship. So we talk about the morning routine. And I know with guys that are high producers and high performers, we all have a morning routine. It's hard to get anything done unless, and when you look at the most successful people on the planet, Jesus is no exemption to this. We see that people get up earlier. The people that get up earlier tend to have all those traits of success, higher net worth, more accomplishment, because they're able to make great use of their time. Um, and we certainly see Jesus do that as well. So although we don't know every single thing he does, we do know he spends the time in prayer in the morning. And there was also considerable planning as to where he would go and how he was led how he was led, those places he would go and constantly being in communion with his father. And as Christian guys, this is where, if we don't have this kind of relationship, this is where Christianity is boring, right? Where I just have words on a page, I just have a bunch of Sunday school stories, and I just have a code of ethics or this rule book that I'm supposed to follow because that's what it means to be a good Christian. No, that's not the life Jesus calls you to. He calls us all into relationship and he models that for us. So my first calling, you know, you asked me the question at the beginning, you know, tell us a little bit about Josh. 
my first calling and the way I know Jesus, the way I know God the Father is son. It's not my title. It's not I wrote a book. Um, it's not what I do in my day job. It's not my LinkedIn profile. I know him as son first. And that's my favorite title. That is my identity. And as a son, I have the right to have communion and conversations with my father where I speak to him and he speaks to me and he reveals his will to me. And that's what Jesus demonstrates for us. And yes, we do have to have discipline in our life. You know, I would have never written this book. I have three kids and they get up early as well. So I had to get up earlier because they would come down and I'd be on the couch or I'd be on my laptop early writing and completing. Um, and when they came down, it was done because I had to go play with them or I could only hold them off for a few more minutes to finish something up. Um, so I find personally for me um, that for me to be productive and do the things I'm called to do, um, especially when it comes to writing or producing or creating, that I need to make the time. I don't find it. I create it. And I personally create it by rising early um, and separating that morning time. And that morning time always starts out with Frank. I don't just get right into work. But following the example of Jesus, I spend time with the Lord first. So true. It Absolutely, yeah. Um, no, we we are incredibly grateful that 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 you that you push yourself to wake up earlier and earlier and earlier. Because had that not been the case, we wouldn't we wouldn't have this to to share with everybody here. So, um, I'm trying to kind of bring bring everything home here, uh, Josh. And, and as we kind of kind of wrap it up, I want to give you know give you a chance to to, to direct everybody and and if they had you know if people want to you know connect with Josh. Well, one thing I don't think we actually um, we talked about the standard, that's the book, but this book actually sits under a much larger mission for you. So can you talk about just standard 59 for a couple minutes? Um, you know, what standard 59 really means and, and, and what is your mission with really creating this movement? Yeah. Thanks Frank. Um, so here's, here's my vision guys, is that if you're a man and you feel disconnected from your purpose, or you feel like, wow, th this guy's speaking about something that I just don't quite have in my life, or maybe I don't know Jesus this way. Um, I've never heard this message, but I am a Christian, uh, but I know I can be doing more, or I know I'm doing well in some areas, but I, I kind of feel I'm out of alignment in a few other areas. That's the vision and the mission of Standard 59, to help guys like that. Um, you know you're a Christian, you know you're created for more, you know you're called for more, but you're not sure exactly how to get there. So Standard 59, the name of it, that's the name of the website, standard59.com, if you want to go there and check it out. But it comes from, and it's inspired from um, the book of Isaiah, the 59th chapter. And in the 59th chapter, Isaiah is talking about the current state of Israel, God's people in the Old Testament. Um, and he's, he's unpacking this and he's sharing how they've lost their way. They're meandering through mediocrity. They're like blind people. They're feeling their way. They left God. They're out of alignment. They're not living their destiny or living into their fulfilled calling that God has on their life. And he's there to call them back. And there's a verse in, the, is in Isaiah, the 59th chapter, it's 59, 19. And he talks about when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will raise up a standard against him, raising up a battle standard against the enemy. And our enemy today, we have multiple enemies on multiple fronts. We've talked about that at the beginning of this interview, Frank, but we do have a real enemy that wants to take us out, right? There's a spiritual force um, that is coming against us and what we're called to do to bring us into mediocrity, to distract us, to defeat us, um, and to bring us into depression if he could. Right. So we were facing real enemies. And then on top of that, um, we have this promise that we that the Lord will raise up a standard. And that's where the standard comes in. And that's why the book is titled The Standard, because Jesus is the standard for men. So in a world where we have all these competing messages, where there's all these subscribe buttons in my feed, if I should listen to this person and that person and I should listen to this message, I need to make sure as a Christian man that I'm defending my domain and I'm only allowing certain messages that are aligned with my calling and my destiny to come into my life. And as a Christian guy, I can't let just any message come in. I can't, I don't have the privilege to hit subscribe to just anything. And if that's you, I would encourage you to visit Standard 59, the work we're doing, the message we're getting out. And I would start with the standard. You know, this is the book. This is the code for guys to follow if you're like, something's missing and I want to live by a higher standard. 
Um, so I take my background, I take the, you know, all the experiences that we have as guys, and I bring it together with this message of Jesus setting the model for masculinity for us as modern kingdom men right now in the day and age that we're living in. Whew. Guys, get get this book. Anybody that is watching this, listen to this, and 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 follows me, likes likes what I have to say. I I have a very small area of, of expertise, things that I could, you know, talk on intelligently and, and, and actually provide value. Uh, but if you guys like anything that I have to say, realize that this man right here, Josh, and this book is where I go. Um, Josh fills me up daily. Um, so so if, if, if you like what I have to say, you're going to love what, what Josh has to say. So Josh, where can, where can everybody connect with you? Where can they, where can they get the standard? Where is, you know, where can they connect with Josh? Where can they follow you? And, and what's next? What's, you know, what are what, what are we to look forward to here in 2021 with Josh and the standard? Awesome. Thanks, Frank. Um, yeah, a couple of things. So number one, guys, um, if you like what I'm saying, hey, one thing I'm going to encourage you to do, you don't have to buy anything from me. You can read your Bible. If you have a Bible in your house, um, make sure you have the word of God and that you're reading it every day. OK, so that's one of the most important things. Um, and that's where I'll point you to. Besides that, if you like the message that you heard today, if you want to hear more, if you want to go deeper on these six attributes that we discuss in the book, that we unpack, if this sounds like this is your flavor, I would encourage you to get the standard. You can visit standard59.com, www.standard59.com, and you'll have all the links there. It's on Amazon. You can get the book. It's going to be coming out on Audible in just a few weeks, we just recorded the audio version. So if you're an audible guy or you want to, you know, listen to it while you're training, while you're working out, you can do that as well while you're in the car. Um, I also have a few other things coming up. So big announcement. Frank's been um, inspirational with this as well. We are going to be launching a podcast and a YouTube channel. In fact, by the time this podcast is airing, the YouTube channel may already be up with some videos. They're currently being edited right now podcast is set to be up for April. So we'll get that out to your listeners as we get closer, Frank. Appreciate that. And hey, I got a couple things I'd love to give you today. So for anyone that wants to learn more, or they're like this, maybe you're thinking this message is a little foreign to me. Um, but I want I'm intrigued, or I want to go deeper, or you said some things that are really resonating with me. Go to standard59.com. And I have a, a, a free guide there called the map. And it's 12 strategies and tactics that we can implement in our life right now. It's basically the code. It's the map for the modern Christian man. It's the map for us to live by. And these are the areas. So if you're looking for a vision, if you're like, I don't have a vision, or I need more inspiration, or I need to know what am I supposed to be doing? I know I'm living below my purpose, then this will be a good starting point for you. Now, I also have a free gift that I'd love to give your audience um, we talked about the book, the standard, and how it's set up into six separate books or six separate sections. Um, the first section we went deep on, it has the intro, and it's, it talks all about self-mastery. Um, I'd love to gift that to you. Um, so what I'll do is I'll give you the e-version of it. If anyone wants to go there, I'm going to drop it. Frank, you can put this in the show notes. Uh, but as my gift to you, this is not on the website. It's a non-index page. But if you go to standard59.com, forward slash free book. Um, just enter your email in there so I know where to send it. And I will send you, I think it's like the first 80 some odd pages of the book. And you can see if you like it, you can start with that on me. I'd love to bless you with it. And you know, the highest compliment that I get from this is that when guys read the book, um, one of the most consistent themes we get is that they want to teach it. They want to go find other guys in community and say, hey, I want to huddle up my guys. I want to huddle up my friends and we want to go through this together, you know, and this book will take you right past the superficial discussion that guys have. And like, let's get right into it. Talk about our lives. Let's get accountable with each other. And let's talk about how we're living and how we're measuring up to Jesus. And, um, and that's what the standards about. So there's more resources on the way and currently being produced right now to help you um, go deeper in the book. If you're looking for a study guide, a leader's guide, a workbook, some other programs we'll be releasing this year in 2021 that I will be, uh, I'll keep you informed on Frank as we move forward. Got it. Yes. We'll get the, we'll get the YouTube channel plugged on in, in the show notes. Um, is that raising the standard? Is that the name of, of, of the channel? The, the name of the channel will be 
raising the standard. You can link it okay. right through standard59.com. If you want to follow me okay, on social, perfect. I'm on Facebook and Instagram, um, at Kingdom Athlete. Josh Cachadorian is really hard to spell. <laughs> and it's hard to remember if I spell it for you right here. So just go to at Kingdom Athlete and you will find me. And uh, we can talk more about what that means the next time. Yeah, Ka- Kashadorian. I still, I still struggle to pronounce it. And funny, Josh, I know I shared this with you. Um, you know, we met in in, in Toronto, uh, July 2017, at that at that dinner, uh, that Italian restaurant. I remember it. Um, you talked about it at the beginning, but your your Instagram title uh, or, or or tag back then was Josh Catch a Moment. Um, but it, Moment, for some yeah. reason, like for some reason, <laughs> like I didn't, I didn't in that meeting, like I didn't get that there was a difference in your last name and in your hash or uh, in your Instagram handle. So when I first put your name in my phone, I put it Josh Catch a Moment. Like I thought your last name was was catch a moment. Um, catch but guys, moment. this is, yeah. um, guys, this is, this, this time flew by. I mean, like, like Josh said, we, we could talk for, for hours. We could talk for days. We could talk for years. We could talk for the rest of our lives about Jesus and not get all across. And, and I think my goal here today was really to provide you guys with a, 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 a very quick, Review. I mean, I wanted to give you, you know, I wanted to give you an idea of, of what to expect out of the same. And I wanted to give, uh, to, to give away as much as possible. Um, so I hope that that we did a good job of translating and, and and getting across what Josh is doing, what you can expect in doing this. But guys, you're getting an entire 80 plus pages for free. Standard59.com/slash/free-book. Uh, not available anywhere else. So I'm gonna plug all that stuff down there. I definitely recommend picking up the strategy or picking up the map for those 12 strategies. Um, and yeah, so I, 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 I think that's it. I think we bring it home here, Josh. And, and, and you know, what's coming here as we, uh, as we bring it to, to an end. So uh, you're, you've listened to, to the show enough times, um, but obviously there's, there's a very clear reason behind why we call it the superhuman life. Uh, you've been very instrumental in, in helping me not just get clear on what that means to me, but it's an ever evolving process. Um, so as I do at the end of every, every episode, I like to, I like to get the guest uh, to give me their, give me their definition. So how would Josh catch a moment <laughs> to find living a superhuman life? So uh, I'll answer that question by first telling you what it not, what it's not for me. Um, it's not trying to do everything in my own power. It's not trying to do everything in my own strength, trying to mastermind my entire life and planning, you know, just some random vision of where I want to be and trying to reverse engineer it. Um, I know that's a popular message in the world right now that you can go get whatever you want and you can do it and you can will yourself to have it. And maybe you can. And it would be a sad day if you get to the end of your life and you accomplish all those things that you wanted for yourself and you find out it's empty, and you find out that it's lacking. So for me, um, and here's what everyone needs to understand, um, you are a supernatural creation. You know, we are created, we have a creator, we have a father in heaven who created us. We're a creature. If we go back to that Genesis, Genesis 1 moment that we opened the show with, you're actually a creature of two realms, right? There's a spiritual realm and a natural realm. And right now, some of you are going to feel like, wow, I feel dead to the spiritual realm. I only feel the natural realm. Well, that's not the way you're created to be. So the superhuman life for me is the supernatural life. And honestly, it's the ordinary life of a Christian. It's the ordinary life of an overcomer. It's the ordinary life for a son of God. And this is, goes for women too, um, for a son or daughter of God to live this superhuman, supernatural life where we're called to do greater things than what Jesus did. He said that of his own disciples. He's like, you will do greater things than me. That's pretty amazing. So if we're not doing those things, we have work to do. We have more that we can step into, but that's the supernatural life. And that's the life I'm pursuing. And that's the life that we're all called to live as a son or daughter of God. Josh, I love you so much. I think I'm going to have to eliminate that question. I'm not sure if it's ever going to be answered any better than that. Well, you know, Frank, for for people that are listening, you know, I'll, I'll just say, 
Um, you know, like we live this stuff, right? Like we really believe it. This isn't just some show. And if someone's listening right now, I'm just going to speak to the audience. I mean, if you're listening to this and you're like, wow, I need what these guys are talking about or I feel distant, or I once knew Jesus, or maybe I don't even know Jesus, but what the heck, who are these guys talking about? I don't know this Jesus. I would love to pray for your audience and just invite them to pray with us, because this is a message. Everything Jesus does, everything he does, everything within the Bible, everything he's still doing is an invitation. He invites us into an encounter with him. That's what he was doing in the Gospels. That's what he was doing when he was speaking in front of crowds. He was inviting them to come, and he's still doing it right now. And if you're hearing this, and if you made it to this far in the podcast, this is not a mistake. I believe you're destined to be here. You're listening, and something kept you here because God's got a plan for your life, whether you're following him or you're like that person we talked about that's a little bit out of alignment. So I would love to pray for you. Um, and and just just bless you with your journey where you are and just the plan that God has for your life. I just want to reassure you that God has a plan for your life. So I'm just going to pray for your audience now, Frank, and for you as well, for all of us. Father, we just thank you for this amazing time. We thank you that your presence is with us. We thank you that you call us into relationship. We thank you that you're not a dry religion, that we can actually know you, that you call us sons and daughters, and that you want to know us and you want to have relationship with us. And I thank you that our identity comes in knowing you first as Father. And I just pray over the audience right now that may not know you this way. And I just pray that you reveal yourself to them as they hunger, as they invoke that curiosity and that interest to follow you and to pursue you, that you would meet them and that you would reveal yourself to them. And right now, if anyone doesn't know Jesus, I'm going to say this simple prayer. It's the prayer that Frank and I prayed in that park on that day in Orlando. And if you don't know him and you want to know him, I'm just going to lead you in this prayer and you can just repeat it where you are right now, in your car, in your house, um, in the gym, it doesn't matter. And here it is. Father, I come before you, a sinner, and I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. I repent of all the sins in my life that keep me separated from you and from your will for my life. Jesus, I acknowledge that you died on a cross for my sins and that you were resurrected. You're no longer in the grave. And I invite you into my life, into my heart, and I pledge to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. It's just that simple. If you invite him in and now you live for him and he shows you how, um, you're in for an amazing journey. And if anyone said that prayer, please reach out to Frank or myself, um, Josh at standard59.com. I'd love to personally talk with you, um, check in with you, anything we can do to help you, assist you in your journey as well. Likewise, guys. Um, I'd love to hear, hear from you. If, if, if this conversation today spoke to you, if, if there's somebody in your life that you know needs this message, um, we ask you always these two things at the end of every single episode. First and foremost, if you're new here and you haven't, you haven't supported us and you haven't helped us grow this, if you could rate the show and review it on Apple, YouTube, if you guys are watching, subscribe to the channel or whatever platform you're on there. Uh, but most importantly, guys, um, like, like Josh said, if, if, if you prayed that prayer at the, at the end here today, reach out to me, reach out to Josh. But most importantly, if there's somebody in your life that needs to hear this, please share this with them. Um, but Josh, I love you so much, brother. Thank you. Thank you for. Thank you for everything. Like I, I, I really don't know where where to take that, but um, that's good. I'm excited Thanks, to to. I'm excited to get this out into the world. I've been pushing you for for a long time. I'm glad that we were able to make this happen today. I can't wait to get this podcast aired. Can't wait to to be involved in, in in teaching this book. I can't wait to see what the standard grows into this year. Incredibly honored and grateful to be in your life, be walking this journey. And and I just thank you for for everything personally that you you've done for me. So, brother, I love you. Uh, love you man. Guys out there, subscribe, review, pick up the standard, read your Bible, connect with Josh. We love you. See you next week. All right. 
Let's raise the standard. 